for 25 years. The colossal battle between Megatron and Optimus Prime has captivated Transformers fans around the world. Now, for the first time, here is the thrilling saga of Optimus and Megatron before they were enemies, before they arrived on Earth, before they even knew each other. Plagiarist Films presents Transformers Exodus by Alexander Christian Irvine Narrated by Mark Allen Chapter 1 The Hall of Records in Iacon was closed to the public. In the archive stacks at a workstation where he had been installed, following the tradition and practice of his caste, sat a monitor named Orion Pax. He was tapped into the communications grid that invisibly spanned all of Cybertron, monitoring and recording every communication that passed through the grid. Those that met certain criteria he listened to, annotated, categorized, and saved in a different sector of the data net. Like much of the rest of the great city of Iacon, the hall was constructed of a golden-hued alloy that lent itself to the curving architectural style that predominated elsewhere in the city. The architects of Iacon had favored towering monumental buildings topped by conical structures that looked as if they might take off. The entire city was a monument to aspirations, only there were no aspirations among Cybertronians anymore. They were born into a caste, a place that they would maintain for their entire lives. The civilization of Cybertron existed in a perfect stasis. It had been that way for millennia. Iacon was in some ways a memorial of a Cybertronian culture that had not existed in the memory banks of any existing Cybertronian. Inside the Hall of Records, another kind of stasis existed. The history of Cybertron, from the mythical ages of battles among the Thirteen Primes across the billions of cycles, to the latest transmissions on the latest bands Orion Pax was charged with monitoring. All of it was here. All of it was categorized, catalogued, stored, indexed, and cross-indexed. After that, save for when the High Council or another authority got interested in a threat to civic order, the ever-growing collections in the Hall of Records were ignored. Once or so, Orion Pax understood from reading in the older records. Cybertronian civilization had maintained links with other planets that surrounded other stars. Via a network of space bridges constructed with technology long abandoned, populations of Cybertronians on far-flung planets had stayed in contact with Cybertron. Gigantion, Velocitron, even the Hub, all were once part of a greater Cybertronian culture. Now the space bridges were all long since collapsed and degraded. The last of them which hung in the skies between the two moons and the asteroid belt had not been used since a long, long time ago. Even Orion Pax, who could ordinarily dig anything out of the records of Teletron 1 and the data net, was not sure exactly how long it had been. Now a Cybertronian like Orion Pax would not go to the stars. He would not fight nobly for the great ideals of the Primes. A Cybertronian like Orion Pax would monitor, assess, and catalog transmissions on the grid because that is what Cybertronians of his caste did. Other castes built and engineered, governed, made laws, or fought in the gladiatorial pits. From there, oddly enough, came some of the more interesting transmissions Orion Pax had heard lately. He was not a great follower of the arena, but even he knew of the most recent champion, Megatronus. Quite a bold action to assume that name. It was not just any bot, who could carry the weight of one of the Thirteen Primes, whose deeds still echoed across the megacycles of history. This Megatronus had not lost a match since the early days of his career in the arena. The gladiators began with no names, and most of them ended that way as well. Megatronus had claimed not just a name, but a name that could not help but capture the attention of even those castes who pretended to pay no attention to such degraded entertainments as gladiatorial combat. The sight of two or more Cybertronians tearing each other apart was something that few would admit enjoying. 
Yet the pits in the lower levels of Kaon were one of Cybertron's most popular tourist destinations. And the grid was alive with broadcasts and rebroadcasts of the various tournaments that were constantly going on. The only industry in Kaon that could rival gladiatorial entertainment was recovery and reconstruction. The two mechasurgical engineers of that city and its gladiatorial rival, Slaughter City, were without peer. Arena combat was illegal across Cybertron, but the High Council in its wisdom understood that a population confined by caste needed certain outlets. So the pits in Kaon, which had begun long ago as a diversion for the workers in the great foundries there, were now entrenched, even if technically outside the law of Cybertron. In Slaughter City it was much the same, so it was odd that from Kaon to Slaughter City, Orion Pax should be hearing and seeing arguments he could only call philosophical. And they were coming from the greatest of the illicit champions of Kaon's pits, this Megatronus. The transmissions were fragmentary and distorted, originating as they did from deep inside the metallic bowels of Kaon. Between those lower levels and the grid receptors, they picked up enormous interference from the industrial processes that drove Kaon. And Orion Pax knew the civilization of Cybertron. Nothing could be created without the raw materials first being refined. That happened in Kaon and the Badlands that stretched between it and the Hydrax Plateau. As long as those Badlands fueled the needs of Cybertron, the High Council would keep turning a blind optic to the Gladiator Pits. Orion Pax wondered how long that would continue. He listened to the most recent of Megatronus's transmissions, fingers hovering over the interface that would determine where he cataloged it. Are Cybertronians not all made of the same materials? My alloys are the same as those in the frame of a High Counselor. My lubricants are the same as those that lubricated the joints of the Thirteen themselves. Megatronus's voice scraped and rasped like one of the great machines in the factories of Kaon. Orion Pax looked up and down the row of other Cybertronians of the same cast as he. All of them would spend their careers monitoring and cataloging, feeding the vast databases of Iacon. This was the way the civilization of Cybertron had been since long before the creation of Orion Pax. And yet they were made of the same materials as the archivist Alpha Trion, or any member of the High Council. Would a counselor spend his life monitoring transmissions? We are individuals! Once we were free! Megatronus's voice scraped through Orion Pax's head. What would his fellow monitors think if they could hear? They would report this Megatronus in a nano-click. That's what they would do, Orion Pax thought. As if in reply, Megatronus said, The High Council, if they heard me now, would quietly render me into slag. Do not doubt it, they may be listening now. If I vanish, carry on my work. Soundwave, you and Shockwave will carry on. You are my trusted lieutenants. A second voice came in. Lieutenants? Are you now the general of an army, Megatronus? Orion Pax listened harder. He ran a check on the new voice. It was neither Shockwave nor Soundwave. He had heard them before, and had records and database entries for each. But this new voice was not in the index he maintained to keep track of Megatronus's associates. Who was it? It was not part of Orion Pax's job to investigate. He monitored, observed, recorded. Investigators were of another caste. He could, however, report to Alpha Trion, the overseer. Orion Pax sampled the new voice and spent a few cycles compiling a report. It wouldn't do to present himself to Alpha Trion without a good reason, and proof of how good the reason was. The archivist of Iacon, Alpha Trion, was far older than Orion Pax, who had heard stories that he had existed since the great age of the space bridge fueled expansion, the high point of Cybertronian civilization. What that must have been like to be able to ride the dimensional bridges to other stars. Orion Pax, Alpha Trion said, what brings you here to interrupt my work? I seek advice. Orion activated the recording of Megatronus. Alpha Trion put down the antiquated stylus he used to make entries in the single book that sat on his desk. 
the archivist of Iacon, had databases and endless hard copy records of virtually everything that had ever happened in the history of Cybertron. Yet he chose stylus and book as his interface. Like many of the older Cybertronians, Orion Pax knew Alpha Trion had grown eccentric. When the recording had played out of a wall-mounted speaker, and Alpha Trion had taken his standard moment to tap his stylus on the desk and think over various potential responses, the archivist said, Megatronus. Why has he named himself after a mythical being? Orion Pax asked. If the old stories are true, Megatronus believed until the end that he would be vindicated, Alpha Trion said. He believed himself to be doing what was right, even if his methods destroyed much of what he professed to believe. Not much of an example if you're plotting a revolution, Orion Pax asked. With a dry chuckle, Alpha Trion stood. Indeed not. But perhaps that is not the only example to be taken from the deeds of Megatronus. Who is this upstart? He has been a gladiator in Kaon. Like all of them, he began without a name. A worker who took to the arena as a way to glory. He has never lost, and his fame has grown to the point that few other gladiators will fight him one on one. Now it seems that he is no longer content to be the greatest gladiator in Kaon. He has grander ambitions. Ambition? Alpha Trion echoed. That is not a quality encouraged on Cybertron. As you know. He fell silent, and Orion Pax thought he had detected something of a wistful tone in the archivist's voice. He waited, and after several cycles, Alpha Trion spoke again. Go back to your post, Orion Pax. Continue to listen. When you know what this Megatronus is planning, return to me and we will consult further. Chapter 2 After young Orion Pax had left him alone in the depths of the Hall of Records, Alpha Trion considered the situation. Unusual in one so young, he thought, to have such a sense of what has gone past, what may never return. But that was to be expected when Orion Pax spent all of his time in the hall listening. The High Council would have to hear of this gladiator calling himself Megatronus. But it was not clear to Alpha Trion what the best way was to present the situation. Covenant, he said softly. What may we know of this Megatronus? The Covenant of Primus lay open on Alpha Trion's desk. He had created it in the aftermath of the War of the Primes. In the Covenant lay the entire history of the Cybertronians and the beings that gave them life, all the way back to Unicron and Primus. And the Covenant also contained the future, although that part of the Covenant remained mutable. Alpha Trion could see certain things that would happen, because they became real as they appeared in the Covenant but he could not always know whether what he saw would come to pass. The burden of knowing the future was Alpha Trion's and his alone, but it was lessened because even what he knew of the future could change at any moment, and he had some power over it as well. The Quill, that instrument young Orion Pax failed to understand, was one of the surviving artifacts of the Thirteen, and was one of the most powerful objects in the known universe. Using it, Alpha Trion could inscribe the future into the Covenant. This was a dangerous power to exercise, and there was never any guarantee that an alteration to the future would last. The Covenant itself had the final word. It was a book of pure destiny. Alpha Trion flipped forward a few pages. One of the peculiarities of the Covenant was that the reader, who existed in a moment in time, had a difficult time understanding the book's language on its pages dealing with the future. Even Alpha Trion could read those pages only seldom. The further into the future the Covenant went, the more obscure and difficult the language became. Its first pages were written in languages that no Cybertronian had spoken in thousands of stellar cycles. On its last pages were words in languages that no Cybertronian had ever yet spoken. Alpha Trion had written it all, even the portions written in languages that did not yet exist. Orion Pax did not know that. 
nor did any of Alpha Trion's other underlings in the Hall of Records. None of them would have believed it if they had been told, and not even the most credulous of the race of Cybertronians would have taken seriously the assertion that Alpha Trion was one of the original 13, the only one he believed remaining on Cybertron. He had seen the history of Cybertron from its creation. He had seen allegiances form and shatter among the Primes. He had observed firsthand the murder that had destroyed the Thirteen, sending them out into the vastness of the universe. With the Covenant, Alpha Trion had stayed behind, to record, to observe, to exert what influence he could without giving away the truth of his identity. Most Cybertronians no longer believed in the Primes, or else considered them semi-historical myths. That was fine with Alpha Trion. It was no longer an age for mythic personalities, or perhaps it was an age for new ones. Alpha Trion wondered what it would be like to understand the Covenant in its entirety, to assimilate all of the knowledge, the consciousness of past and future collapsing together in his mind. It was the doom of the Archivist to wrestle with what he would never understand. Hearing the name Megatronus had put Alpha Trion in a frame of thought that could almost have been called nostalgic. The days of the War of the Primes were still alive in his memory. The golden age that had followed, as Cybertronians had ridden the space bridges to the stars, was one of the great historical periods in the history of the known universe. The magnificence of it, now past, could only be hearkened back to. Alpha Trion remembered the gradual rise of the caste system. He had spent much time talking to Sentinel Prime about the direction Cybertronian civilization was going. In the end, they disagreed. Sentinel Prime defined himself by actions and thought only about near-term goals and results. Alpha Trion had no need to define himself. He was one of the Thirteen, whether any sentient being knew it or not. And he thought about more distant horizons of consequence. After their last argument, Sentinel Prime had dismissed Alpha Trion to the Hall of Records. Disappear into the stacks and let the dust cover you, Alpha Trion. Cybertron has no need of you anymore. Those had been Sentinel Prime's last words. Megatronus, Alpha Trion whispered. Now another had arisen among the anonymous masses of downtrodden laborers claiming the name of Megatronus. This was in the Covenant as well. Alpha Trion had no thought to see it happen in exactly this way, but since it was in the Covenant's pages, it was bound to happen. This Megatronus, this gladiator and factory worker with grandiose ambitions. How much did he even know about the Prime from whom he had chosen to borrow his name? Alpha Trion forced himself back into the present. He began to search in recent records for any evidence of unrest in Kaon. It didn't take long before he was immersed in a story the likes of which he had not expected to find in the regimented cities of Cybertron. He looked up and opened a grid link between his desk and Orion Pax's. Please return, he said. Orion stood opposite Alpha Trion, waiting for the archivist to finish writing in the large book open on his desk. Setting down his stylus, Alpha Trion looked up at Orion Pax. Megatronus didn't begin right away planning a revolution, he said. Not on a planet-wide scale in any case. He began by taking over the gangs who run the gladiator pits in Kaon and Slaughter City. Criminals, Orion Pax said. He started to speak, then stopped again as he realized that he had been about to say that he thought this kind of criminality was inevitable in a caste-bound society. Alpha Trion looked at him expectantly, then went on. Before he had a name, or took a name, he was a champion gladiator. He had some success. That meant others of his caste looked to him for his strength. He became a leader without meaning to. Images and video flashed across a hollow display over Alpha Trion's desk. The images were of destroyed Cybertronians, each one labeled with a name. Indexing them quickly, Orion Pax discovered that each victim had been involved in running the gladiator pits, and most of them had other criminal enterprises as well. In the video, Megatronus, this was the first time Orion Pax had seen him, stood over the sparking and twitching body of one of the low-level crime bosses Orion Pax had already seen in a still image. It begins here, he said directly to the camera. 
Behind him, a number of other gladiators raised their right arms, standing silently. You who take your pleasure from our suffering and turn our work into your leisure, you have forgotten what it is to be a Cybertronian. Once this was the greatest planet in the galaxy, now we have fallen, but we rise again. Because there are yet Cybertronians who can envision the restoration of our former glory. I have never had a name, but now I take the name Megatronus, naming myself for the greatest of the thirteen, the one who refused to bow before any of the others. Only by knowing how far we have fallen will we understand what it is to rise again. Cybertron! Cybertron! roared the other gladiators in unison. The video cut out. You had not seen this? Alpha Trion prompted Orion Pax, who shook his head. Ah, this is the fruit of discouraging ambition. We train generations of Cybertronians who do not imagine what might be done. Orion Pax, unsure what to say, remained silent. Alpha Trion smiled at him. Never fear, Pax. I will tell you the simple truth. This is no game designed to entangle you in words you do not mean. All I say is that we live in a certain world. Few of us imagine what it might be like to live in another. But some of us, some of us remember what other worlds were like once. And some of us are foolish enough to wish that we might live in such a world again. There was a pause in the room, broken only by the whisper of Alpha Trion's stylus on the pages of the book. What are you writing? Orion Pax asked at last. I am writing what I have learned, Alpha Trion said. As time passes, we will all discover together whether I have understood correctly. But now you must return to your post. Think on what I have said. I will, promised Orion Pax. And he did, all the way through the mazy corridors of the Hall of Records, back to his station on the 18th floor. Third from the northwest corner, where when the winds blew out of the north, the cold made the lights of Iacon twinkle in the distance. He enjoyed being close to a window, many of his colleagues were not. Some of us are foolish enough to wish that we might live in such a world again. What had Alpha Trion meant? Orion Pax turned the archivist's words over in his mind, and could reach no conclusion. No comfortable conclusion in any event. The only way Alpha Trion's words made sense was as an encouragement to think. Was this even safe to think in one's own mind? To think beyond caste? To remember that Cybertron had not always been so rigidly divided. To imagine that a future might exist in which Cybertron was restored to its former greatness. Orion Pax listened and cataloged and archived and indexed, but his mind was not on his work. The noises of the grid were incomprehensible to him now that Alpha Trion had opened his mind to a possibility beyond Cybertron as it was. Who was this Megatronus, this gladiator thug, killer of criminals and criminal himself, who gave voice to a longing that Orion Pax had never known he felt? Chapter 3 The pit floor was rectangular and large enough for a regiment to hold exercises on, 200 mechanometers on its short sides and half again that distance on the long sides. It was made of ore pebbles crushed and discarded from the foundries because their concentration of metals was too low to be useful. Spaced at irregular intervals around the floor, mechanical debris and burning heaps of trash made optics tricky and created endless opportunities for tactical ambush and blindside attacks. Surrounding the floor, four levels of seating rose vertically to a ceiling a hundred mechanos overhead. Banks of light in every frequency from infrared to ultraviolet drenched the floor in merciless light. The stands were jammed with workers in the factories and elemental refineries of Kaon, stomping their feet in rhythm until the entire balconies of each level bounced up and down to nearly the limits of the metal frame's tensile strength. The noise was already overwhelming and would grow so loud in the course of the match that the gladiators would fight with no input from their audio arrays save a constant maxed out white noise. A hundred times and more, Megatronus had entered a pit either this one or another much like it. Every time he had emerged victorious, 
the Tournament of Champions, this arena's circuit's grandiose name for itself, had now changed the rules for Megatronus's opponents, allowing them to enter first and assume alt form if they chose. Anything they could scan and assimilate might be turned into a camouflage shape. It was a cowardly way to fight, but it worked in Megatronus's favor. When he could give the opponent the first shot, the opportunity to ambush him, and survive to win a total victory despite this, he looked invincible. Word was spreading. It was not so many stellar cycles ago that Megatronus had been merely one of the more fearsome gladiators in the Kaon pits. Now he was without question the most feared. It had not been so long ago that Megatronus still had no name. Now he had chosen a name to strike fear into the timid and inspire loyalty among those who would follow him. That it was not his name did not concern him in the least. He who was born with no name did not care where his name came from when he took one. There, he thought, my opponent is there. His optics had locked on a heap of discarded body parts, the kind of scrap heap seen in the aftermath of an industrial accident when dead Cybertronians lay awaiting reclamation and reconstruction. It was obvious, but Megatronus had long since realized that few of his opponents had any tactical subtlety. Above and around him, the crowd thundered. He looked up at them and raised his arms over his head, waving them into an even greater frenzy. This had dual purposes. One, it got the crowd on his side, and two, seeing Megatronus pantomiming victory before the fight had even begun would enrage any opponent with a shred of self-respect. Angry opponents were careless opponents. Careless opponents were dead opponents. The logic was flawless. From the pile of body parts erupted not one, but three fighting bots. They were collectively one of Shockwave's combiner experiments. He could tell right away from the way they moved together, and these three were primitive, drones barely capable of what more advanced Cybertronians considered consciousness. One immediately changed into an all-terrain vehicle. Its tracks studded and magnetic, it headed for one wall of the pit, looking for a higher vantage point to establish a crossfire. Megatronus kept focused on the other two, which sprang immediately at him. The first he knocked down with a blaster shot, the second he swatted aside with a sweeping backhand, keeping the ATV in his peripheral vision. Megatronus pivoted to prevent the two bot form combiners from flanking him. One of them reared up and sprayed a stream of corrosive fluid at his face. He ducked aside, feeling the spray of it burn on his shoulder. The second made another pass at him, its eight bladed tipped hands flicking out at him. Megatronus caught the combiner's arm just above the bladed wrist. Another jet of acid splattered across his back. With a roar, he broke the arm off and flung it into the crowd. This was a calculated maneuver. He wanted them to know that he was dangerous. That when you went to watch Megatronus fight, he was always on the verge of bringing the entire arena down on all of their heads. He fought like he knew he would die and did not care, but also like he knew he could never die and so could take any risk without fear. The arm, sparking and leaking the residue of the Vibroblade's Energon Reservoir, spun into the second deck some spectators lunged out of its way, while others reached to catch it. In a click, Megatronus saw the blade slash and eat through a spectator's arm, saw another in the crowd grab the arm near the break and fling it up into the deck above him, saw fights break out in the aftermath. But he could watch it no further, because the bot on the walls was opening up on him with concentrated energy fire beyond what he would have expected in a Cybertronian so small. The blasts knocked him off balance momentarily, and the acid spitter closed in to take advantage. Megatronus took the next volley of energy fire across his back as he closed with the mutilated combiner. Always finishing a kill was his philosophy. Two wounded enemies were still two enemies. He closed the distance between them in a leap and used his larger mass and greater strength to drive the wounded combiner into the base of a pile of debris. Acid streaked his back again, but Megatronus ignored it. He had taken the best shot that Combiner could give, and it would not kill him. At least not sooner than he could kill it and its wheeled comrade. He held down the wounded bot, rammed the muzzle of his ion cannon into the joint where its neck met its multi-armed thorax and blew it apart. Now the three bots would never be able to assume their combined form. This was another reason to finish a kill. A chittering sound reached him, even over the hysterical collective scream of the crowd at the match's first kill. Megatronus lifted the dead combiner up, 
swung it over his head and flung it away to crash against the wall opposite the seating deck where he had thrown its arm. The acid sprayer landed on his back in the next moment, its pointed nozzle looking for vulnerable points on the back of Megatronus's head and neck. He was Megatronus. He had no vulnerable points. He reached back with both hands, grabbed the acid spitter, and slammed it to the floor. Small pieces of it broke off, and Megatronus went in for the kill. This one he would do with his bare hands. But surprises were yet in store. The combiner wriggled out of his grasp, then slithered with surprising speed across the broken terrain of the floor to join the ATV on the wall. The two of them then merged, combining into a single alternate form that leaped up into the air and hovered. So, Megatronus thought, I was wrong. Even with only two of them, they can combine. It stopped, hovering perhaps 40 mechanos above the center of the pit floor. Extruded tentacular cables unspeeled the catch on girders and keep the combiner up in the air. From there, it rained energy blasts down on him, from blaster-adapted legs, occasionally swooping lower to discharge globules of acid from its mouth. What strange forms the combiners were, Megatronus thought. To surrender their individuality and merge together like that, it repelled him. He hated them, all of them. Any Cybertronian willing to give up its own identity was not worthy of the name. He changed form, adopting the alt form he had learned soon after his creation a tank adapted for heavy mining and demolition work. The combiner darted away as Megatronus's battery of proton blasters exploded across its carapace and severed one of its cables. It fell, swinging back down on the other cable toward the arena floor. Megatronus roared toward the higher end of the arena, closing with a speed it hadn't anticipated. It zigzagged through the pit, jinking so close to the balconies that the front row audience alternately ducked away or reached out to grab it. Megatronus caught it up near the top of the debris pile that was the highest point on the arena floor, reassuming his proto-form as he collided with it and kept hold. One hand on an arm and the other clamped on its thorax, his optics momentarily flared out as it jammed an energy cannon in his face and fired. His pile of debris. The savage glee of the crowd vibrated in all of Megatronus's sensors. Now was the time to end this. Megatronus reared up over the disoriented combiner and manifested twin maces in both hands. He stomped down on the combiner's back, holding it in place. It chattered, tried to divide, and failed. Its limbs scrabbled for purchase and leverage. But he was far too strong. Raising both maces, Megatronus let his gaze roam across the crowd, which was, if anything, more berserk than before. Combiners, he thought scornfully, next they would send out minicons for him to step on. Who defeats Megatronus? He roared out and struck. Lubricants and bits of combiner spattered him. No one! No one defeats Megatronus! He struck again and again, butchering the combiner where it lay. Then he emptied his hands and raised his arms again. I still function! Striding from one end of the pit to the other, he pointed into the crowd. Would you challenge me? You? Anyone, any five of you, any ten of you, challenge me now for everything I have ever won. No one defeats Megatronus. Back in the center of the pit, he kicked apart the remains of the combined Insecticon flyer and flung pieces of it into the crowd for trophies. Remember, he called out, remember that you saw Megatronus. It is the best day of your life. Remember. Their adulation rained down on him like Energon like life itself. Never again will I be nameless, Megatronus thought. Megatronus! 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 Something odd happened as the chant intensified. The last syllable of the moniker started to fade out as the crowd made a collective choice to end the chant on a strong syllable. Megatronus listened and felt a strange thrill as his name modulated, changed, transformed. He was renamed by his followers given a name that no Cybertronian had ever carried. The arena shook with the force of the chant. Megatron! 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 Yes, he thought. I will be Megatron, and Cybertron will never be the same. He raised his arms amid the smoke and debris of the pit and the shattered bodies of his opponents. No Cybertronian could oppose him. Megatron was destined for great things. Soon he would no longer be a gladiator, Soon he would lead the gladiators, 
He strode victorious out of the pit and into the complex of abandoned maintenance tunnels below a factory that had once churned out components for semi-autonomous mining machinery. Now, most of the subterranean space in the factory complex was given over to the illicit but highly profitable gladiator tournaments. Gladiator mechas and Cybertronians lived, trained, fought, and were repaired here. The ones who died were turned into useful scrap. Until perhaps an orbital cycle ago, all of this had been under the control of a syndicate of crime bosses who ran the gladiators like machines. Who was to know or care? The caste that produced workers in the factories of Kaon was beneath the notice of the higher castes. As long as raw materials were turned into finished goods, the engineering and government castes never spared a thought for their fellow Cybertronians, who slaved in the refineries and smelters. The criminal syndicate took advantage of this in a number of ways. One was the creation of the Gladiator Circuit, another was the manipulation of results in that circuit. Megatron had chafed under the control of the bosses for some time. Things came to a breaking point when they came to him one day offering a deal. You're the finest gladiator we've ever seen, they said. A real immortal. But the stands aren't as full. They won't be as long as everyone knows you're going to win. At that point, in a room much like the one he stood in now, after a match much like the one he'd just fought in, Megatron had known what was coming. We need someone else to win, the bosses said. Not every time, but once or twice. Starting next time you go into the pit, it had been a moment of the sort that comes along only once, perhaps in a sentient being's life. The moment Megatron reflected, when you decided whether you were going to surrender control to someone else or fight to the death to keep it, he had decided to fight. Moments later, the bosses and their strong-armed bodyguards were in pieces, save one. Megatron sent him out to spread the word. The gladiator pits were under new management. Now Megatronus was no longer. Megatron thought of that moment, that transformative moment, as he came into the infirmary and saw Soundwave and Shockwave waiting for him. Soon you'll be leading more than gladiators, Shockwave said, coming over to examine Megatron's damage. Shockwave was Megatron's pet mad scientist, the kind of mind who would take two critically damaged gladiators and try to make one super Cybertronian out of them. He had no ethical sense that Megatron had ever been able to detect. And Megatron did not trust him. But Shockwave was a believer in Megatron, at least for now. There would come a time, Megatron knew, when Shockwave would turn on him. Until then, the Cybertronian genius would be Megatron's most loyal ally. Soundwave was a different matter. Spymaster extraordinaire. Controller of a horde of minicons so small that Megatron could crush several of them with a footstep. Soundwave was the only gladiator Megatron had ever fought who had a chance of beating him. They had met in a match to first wound rather than death, otherwise only one of them would still exist. He was nearly as single-minded as Megatron, nearly as dedicated. He possessed a suite of abilities that Megatron very nearly envied with his multiple transformations and the triple minicons that he contained within his proto-form, and could eject into combat at any time. These were Rumble, Ravage, and Laserbeak. Megatron looked around and did not see any minicons. That suited him well. He did not trust the minicons, any of them. He was unsuited to subterfuge, disliked telling lies except when it was absolutely necessary, and would have much preferred to take whatever he wanted on Cybertron by straightforward force of arms. Part of the reason he kept Soundwave and Shockwave close was that he trusted them to remind him when this was not possible. Megatron was mighty, he knew that, but he could still benefit from associates whose abilities complemented his. Minimal scarring from acids, Shockwave pronounced. The energy weapons had little effect, as is typical Megatronus. You emerge from a battle with few signs of ever having been in a battle. What fascinating prototypes I could create from you. Megatron! Shockwave stopped in mid-reverie, blinking and returning to the real world from his imagined army of Megatron-inspired supermechs. What? You heard the crowd! I am Megatron! Soundwave and Shockwave looked at each other. All hail Megatron! They said, 